Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. We've had a problem with the audio, so we'll have to re resume a little bit. We'll just go, go back a little bit, if, that, if I have your permission. So today we are um, continuing with the, the Johara of Imam al -Laqani. We've been just talking about the lines here. We have been uh, teaching it for the last 15 minutes, but we'll go back <laughs> just quickly. We're talking about line 23, which is where we reached. Fawajibun lillahi fawajibun lahul wujudu wal qidam. So I mentioned here that this science is divided up into three chief areas, ilahiyat, nubuwiyat, or rusuliyat, and sam'iyat. We're starting with ilahiyat because that's the source. Uh, that's, that, that's the ashraf, the most noble of, of all of these things. It's from, from them come the messengers and from them come the sama, which is the guidance in the forms of the books and the the examples of the prophets who were sent. So the ilahiyat and the science relating to what is necessary and impossible and possible for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then nubuwiyat, the same for the prophets. And finally, sam'iyat, the things we have to believe because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has revealed them to us or through either his books or through what the messengers said, the things that are necessary to believe, such as the fire in the garden and things of that nature, and all of the different books that have been sent and the different prophets that have come and so on and so forth. So we're starting with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and what is necessary for him. And the first thing that is necessary for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, given the world that we live in and what we see in front of us, the first thing that is necessary is that Allah is, that there is, that there is a creator, that there is a God who created everything around us. And I mentioned the proof of that was because everything that is that has a beginning has to have had something to bring it into beginning. So that's called wujud. For wajibun lahul wujud, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has to have existence, he has to be. And that is the that, the essence to which we can attach all of these other attributes to describe how this world comes comes about. But what other things are necessary? If you say that Allah necessarily exists. That's what we come to, the sifat salbiya, what are called the uh, negating attributes. The attributes that um, you cannot encompass what they are in your mind or your aql. The only way to understand them is to negate the opposites from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We can understand something having a beginning and an end. We can't understand something never beginning and never ending. So we say Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is qadim, he has qidam, that means he never had a beginning. And we say that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has baqa, which means he goes on, he never has an end. And as I mentioned, the proof of that is that if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala could have been non-existent at some point, then he could be non-existent now. But we've already said that the primary thing we've already agreed is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala necessarily has to exist. That means he necessarily always has to have existed and will necessarily always exist. So those two attributes, you can understand them from wujud, but the people of this science like to emphasize them to make sure nobody misunderstands what is meant by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala having existence. And so they include them, these two attributes. La yushabu bil adam, this final part of the line simply means it is not mixed with Adam. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, his existence is not like our existence, which once had a period of non-existence and then entered into existence and then is followed by a period of non-existence in terms of our corporeal forms, or in terms of our ruh, we, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala create, not in terms of our ruh, but in terms of our, our nafs, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created them. We're, we're, we're not eternal beings, so we had existence, non-existence, then existence, then non-existence. So that particular thing is something that doesn't affect Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. His non-existence is not interspersed with periods of non-existence. It is, he is for, he's forever existent. وَأَنَّهُ لِمَا يَنَالُ الْعَدَمُ مُخَالِفٌ And that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is مُخَالِفٌ لِلْحَوَادِثِ This is how they refer it. الْمُخَالَفَةُ لِلْحَوَادِثِ um, that means being distinct or separate or different or unlike 
everything that is hawadith, everything that Adam, that non-existence, that, is, that, that can impact. Everything in this world, for example, me, you, this mosque, the planets, the suns, the seas, whatever it is, everything can be impacted by non-existence. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is different to that. That means he does not share anything. Any anything that you can think of in your mind that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is in terms of form or in terms of um any other thing that you can come come up with that he has not described himself with, or you cannot work out that he has to have that from what we see in front of us. You cannot ascribe that to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He is different to it. The proof of this is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala having been here forever. In other words, again, forever, I use advisedly. <laughs> um, in other words, everything that is hadith had a beginning. And uh, that is the primary thing that, that marks them is this fact that they are in the world of form. They are in, they are emergent. They come into being and they leave being. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not like that. He is outside of that world of form because he is not hadith. He didn't have a beginning. So he is different to it. Because what is the primary, what, when, you, when you talk about the hawadith, they have what's called arad. I mentioned them to you. Things like motion, sickness, life, death, hot, cold white, black, all of these various different things with which you describe things. All of those types of so things are called arad. Um, all of those things, as I said, start and stop. So if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had any of these forms of attributes that we can describe things in this existence with, he would also have to start. Because all of the attributes by which we describe things in this existence have a beginning point. Even a thought, a thought has a start. You start to think it, and then you stop thinking it. You understand? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala cannot be, cannot be like anything because he is qadim. I and mean, the simple fact that he is qadim means he cannot be described by anything which is of that form, because that would automatically make him part of this world. So that's the proof. He says, Burhan, the Burhan, the proof of this is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala having qidam. Qiyamuhu bin nafsi. So this is the fourth of what are called the sifat salbiya, the negating attributes. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is totally self sufficient. That he does not have need of a mahal, of a form. Of, of like a like a body or a place to be in order for him to do things he doesn't have have need have, have a need of we're not going to go into the things of hands and feet but he has he, do, he doesn't have a need of of particular forms of things in order to do things or in order for him to be so he doesn't need a a either somebody who gave him the capacity to do things. Everything that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does, he or, 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 or has done, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is totally self-sufficient. Nobody needs to help him to do anything. He doesn't need sleep. He doesn't need rest. He doesn't need anything that we... It's the opposite of need. This is called ghina al-mutlaq as well. You might have heard of that term. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the ghari. Totally without need. We are the faqir, the ones who are in need of him. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has no need of anything for anyone. He doesn't have, he has no need, one of the famous ones, he has no need of our good actions. It's all for our it's all for us. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has no need of our recognition. It's all for us. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does have has no need of anything 
from anyone apart from himself. As Qiyam bin Nafs. Wahdaniya. Then the one after which this science is named, perhaps the most elevated of all of these attributes in one way, because this is called the Ilm al Tawheed, is the fact that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is one. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has one, what is called oneness. And you have oneness in your in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's essence, which is called his that, oneness in his attributes, which are called sifat or awsaf, and oneness in his actions, which are called af'al. What does that mean? That means that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the only one who has those attributes. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the only one who does those actions. Allah, and when we say it also, it means with respect to his that, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the only that. There is no other partner alongside him, no one else who has a similar level of being a muhdith, of being a creator. It's only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he's not divisible. He doesn't have parts like we have arms and legs and feet and hearts. And he's, he's not, you can't sort of remove a part and then that would be a part of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala separate from him because it's been removed. It's, he's inseparable. It's, he's one. You can't sort of split him into bits. Um, um, it also means in terms of the attributes that there is only one of these attributes. It's not, it's not like we think of in, you know, in superhero comics, for example, they have this ability and that ability and they're all separate. You separate each ability by whatever it is, like, for example, the power of flight or the power, whatever it is. You can't divide them, subdivide Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's power, for example, or his knowledge. He has knowledge of this thing and not his knowledge and knowledge of that thing, and it's a separate in a separate area. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has has knowledge. He has power. They're not subdivisible. They separate when they become co connected, but only in the created thing, not in the actual power of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or the knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And with respect to actions, when we say Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is one in, the, in his actions, what that means is something quite profound. Is that no action happens except that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one that does it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in Surah Safat, He is the one who creates you and creates what you do. So when you have the impetus to do something, you only accomplish that thing because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who does it for you. Because he is the fa'il al-mukhtar, the one who does actions. There are no actions done. And you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's actions include things like creation, bringing, giving life, giving death, um, provision, provision. Your provision doesn't come to you from what you do. <laughs> Your provision comes to you because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives it to you, for example. When you make bake a cake, when you create a cake, you're not the one who created the cake. When a fire burns, it's not the fire that has the power of burning or that does the action of burning, and so on and so forth. They talk about the proof of this. They say the proof for this attribute of wahdaniya is that if there were more than one ilah, and you have to first remember what is the definition of an ilah? An ilah is one who has power over everything such that everything has need of, of it. That's what an ilah is, or, or him, because the word it in English is a very disrespectful word. So. An ilah is, has no need, Allah has no need, for example, of anything, and everything has need of Allah. That's the definition of ilah. So if you want to have more than one ilah, that has to apply to both of them. Is that possible? Um, so we, we, so that means that there has to, if, if they are working together, for example, they talk, they say, if you say that there's more than one, then either they're working together or they're working across purposes. If they're both working together, and we say it has to apply to every single thing, 
if you have power over something. If you if you talk if you take one thing, one molecule, let's say, and the creation of that molecule in a particular time and in a particular place, um, and both are working together at the same time, then you're having two causes to one cause, which is something that doesn't make any sense. That one thing happens, but two things have, have caused it. So, so, in terms of the actual creation of that thing. Two, two acting on it doesn't doesn't make sense. If they then you can say, okay, what if they were working together such that one of them did part of it and then the other one completed it? But then that would impose the condition on the second one that in order for this universe to exist, he'd be compelled to complete the work of the other. So there would then be compulsion. And the first one would not have the power over that thing because the final act of creating it would not have been done by by him. So he wouldn't actually have had the full that wouldn't have had need of need of him in order for it to be there um well then you can say well, what if one creates some of it and the other creates some of it which is the other possibility so then that but as i said what is the definition of ilah that everything has need of allah and that allah has no need of anything so those things that were created by the other one have then their need, their their existence, their subsistence, and their being relates to the other and not to the first. So then they don't have need of that first. So then he's not neither of them are truly ilah if it's only part and part. They haven't met, and so he doesn't have power over everything. And we um, and this thing of how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala having power over everything is necessary because every hadith needs a, muh a muhdith. Nothing can be without there being something to bring it in. So, I mean, it's, it's basically an impossibility because that would mean that the, the one would not have power over, over what the other has power over. And that would mean uh, ajs, which is lack of power, which would mean that power would then not be a nece necessary attribute. And the other one is if they are cross purposes, then the world would not exist because two opposites cannot coexist. And so the fact that the world is here means that one, if there were two gods, one of them must have won out over the other, which means that only one of them is truly a god because the other one is powerless in the face of that one. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in his Quran, Lo kana alihatun illallah if there were gods other than Allah in exist in in that had led to the creation of this world, the it would have it would not exist. It would just all collapse. Nothing would work. And he says, And then if that had been the case that there was more gods than one, then each god would have had its own domain. And um one of them would have won out over the others, as in the the way with human beings, when you say that they are of a similar similar type. But that's not what happened either. either. So he says, Munazahan Saniya. These Ausaf of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, these attributes that we've been talking about, are Saniya, which is comes from the word Sana, which can mean light. They're illuminated. They're elevated, they're lofty, they um they guide to the way of understanding who who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is, or allowing us to understand our tawheed and have knowledge of Allah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is munazza, is above, disassociated from, has no connection with, and dhidlin. So these are some of the things that are also salb, are impossible for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, um, which will help us better understand these attributes that we've been talking about. He said Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala cannot have a dhid, which is an opposite, an equal and opposite force. I mean, I believe the uh, ancient Iranians before Islam used to believe uh, the, the Magians, Majus, they used to believe in two opposite forces of good and evil, equal and opposite sort of but you know that means that good there is a place where good cannot be where evil is and there's a place where evil cannot be where good is so which means that neither good nor evil has 
true qudra, has true power. And also has this dichotomy of constant, the existence being a constant battle between two forces. Aw shibhin sharikin mutlaqa nor any sort of shibh, anything comparable to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in any way. Um, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is above having somebody uh, worshipped alongside him, a sharik. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is above having anybody associated with him. For example, so-and-so healed me. When you're talking about particular attributes, even in that way, lesser shirk or complete shirk, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is disassociated from that. Subhanallah. That's what we say when we say Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is munazzah. We say subhanallah. Glory be to him above that. He is above having an opposite, anything like him, or a partner that's worshipped alongside him, mutlaqan in any shape or form, whether it's a person, whether it's a piece of wood, or an idol, or whether it's simply associating actions with other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, not, not in a way of, of adab, when you have adab towards people, when they, you know, when you go visit a doctor and you thank him for what he's done for you, but in the sense of in your heart, you believe that that was where it came from. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is above that. Well, walid, kadha al walad, so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is above having a father. In other words, that he came out of something or someone else, a, a world being a father or a mother or any any source, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not, was not there and then came out of that. Or a world that anything came from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and this is referring to the Christians who believe that Sayyidina Isa alayhi salam is the son of Allah, in other words, was with Allah and then separated from his essence as like a bit of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's essence came out to create a son. Again, that goes against wahdaniyyah because it's saying that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is divisible. And also, usually the way of children is that they are similar to the parents. When you say a, a walid and a walid, as indicates that, that they have a, a, a similar level of being. Maybe a child is not as strong as their parents, but they are comparable. Well, astiqa. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not have what's called astiqa. Have you heard that term before? Yeah. Friends. So, he, so they say well, to explain this, a friend is someone who will you know, will go out of his way when things are difficult to, uh, when you are struggling to, to, to benefit you, even if that brings harm on himself. So he will, he will do his best, even if he puts himself and his own affairs at risk to make sure that your affairs are set right and you are well. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not have anybody like that because there's nobody at a similar level that does something like that for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about people being his awliya and things of that nature. It's not talking about people who can bring benefit to him by, by their love for him or their, they cannot help him. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has nobody who, he doesn't need help of anybody. That's what, well, that's what that means. And it also means that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't have enemies in the sense of anybody that can do him harm. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about his enemies, he's talking about people who go against his commands. Not people who can do anything against him, just people who rebel against what he has commanded of mankind. Again, as I said, the whole, whole thing about Satan being the enemy of God in the sense that he can harm, cause harm. I mean, you, you, all of these shows that they create in, in Hollywood, for example, they, they, there seems to be almost some undercurrent of certain Christians who even believe that, that Satan is a force who can harm God. <laughs> That's not what we that's that's not what we accept. We do not accept anybody as a on the on the level of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who can cause harm to him or can bring benefit to him. So that basically also means that somebody, for example, 
if all you know, there's the famous hadith, if everybody in the world were, were, were to have the iman of the, of the of the greatest amongst us, it would not benefit Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala at all by the amount of a thimble of water out of the ocean. But that's simply a way of saying at all. And if everybody was doing the actions of the worst, most dissolute person, it would not harm Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala at all. There's nothing that anything in creation can do that can harm or help Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. وَقُدْرَةٌ إِرَادَةٌ وَغَايَرَتْ أَمْرًا وَعِلْمًا وَالرِّضَى كَمَا ثَبَتْ so he now moves on to the second types of attribute. They're called the sifatul ma'ani, the attributes of meaning. They are they are they are things that require an essence to be there in order for them to. Have, they give meaning to an essence. So they are the way that that essence then interacts with what is here in many ways. Um, so we we see the world. In order for this world to be, we've accepted that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala exists and he has all of these qualities that make him separate from all of this, but this is here. So how does this come about? This is where the Sifat al-Mani come in. To get from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala being unlike everything, how do we then reconcile what we have here? How does this come into being? We know it's here. Um, by the fact is here, we know there must be a, a, a Allah, but what attributes are they by which he brings this into being? And obviously the first is Qudra. He has to have the power to do this. Um, and this has to be combined with what is called Irada, the will to do it. So, because basically Qudra and Irada are two things that are connected solely with the things that are possible. We might say, say the sea of potentials everything that might be for example uh, let's talk about time in a particular being in a particular place in time talking about us here in this in, in uh, sitting in this mosque the fact that we are here in this mosque is one possibility we could be in another country the fact that we are here in this time is another possibility that out of however many how much time has passed we could be at any point but the possibility us being here is, is one possibility. The fact that we are short or tall, the fact that we are alive or dead, the fact that we are white or black or whatever it might be, all of these various things are all possibilities. None of them have to be. They're just possibilities. All of these possibilities are open to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He has the power to do any of them. But the fact that we are here shows that he also has to have the will to have made them be now, where we are at this particular moment. Just simply having power without will doesn't means that nothing ever ever comes to pass. Will is what gives definition to that power and form. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's power and his will do not relate to his necessary himself, his necessary attributes. Allah does not have the power to will himself out of existence. Allah does not have the power to stop seeing, to stop hearing to to die they're not anything relating to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's will and power Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's will and power solely relates to this creation and what was before this creation when before it took form Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala still had that because the that that power of the he he still had that power and 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 will to do whatever he wanted to do that was there you can't say that it suddenly only came into existence the moment existence came about. Otherwise, what's precipitated? amran. <laughs> so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's will, the fact that he wills something, is different from his command. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commands us to worship him. But there are people who don't worship him. And we say that those people who don't worship him are, do, are going against the will of Allah. No. You can't say that. Because everything that is 
the way it is is by his will. So his will is different from his command. It's not the same thing. Allah's command is one thing, and his will is another thing. Similarly, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's ilm is different from his will. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's ilm, his knowledge, also encompasses himself and all of the things that are necessary for himself. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows of his own existence. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows of his sight and his hearing and all of these attributes. But he has his will, cannot affect any of them. He cannot will them not to be or to be different to the way they are. They are how they are. They are necessary. So that's what he means when he says it's not the same thing that Allah's power and Allah, Allah's will and his knowledge are not mutaradif. They're not the same meaning. There's a different meaning here. When we say Allah wills something and Allah knows something, it's not always exactly the same meaning. Allah, what Allah wills. It's not the same as Allah, what Allah knows. Yes, Allah's knowledge encompasses what he wills, but his will does not encompass everything that he knows, is what he's saying. Is that clear? Or is that quite? And it also, khayarat ar um, Also, Allah's power, what, what pleases Allah's power ta'ala is not the same as what he wills. The fact that Allah's power ta'ala wills something does not mean that the thing that happened is something that obtains his pleasure. لا يرضى لعباده الكفر Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not satisfy it, is not pleased for his slaves to have kufr. Does the fact that he's not pleased about that mean that there are no kufar? No. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's will, because nothing happens except that he willed it, does include the fact that there are kufar. So Allah has will fits some things that he is not pleased about, i.e. that do not get his pleasure, that he will not obtain his reward. Kemathabat, as has been proved in the Book of Allah and, among, and by the, what the Messenger of Allah وسلم, said, what is being established. Allah tells us in his book that there are kufar. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us that he has commanded them to do certain things and that they have disobeyed. So we know that. But we also know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, nothing happens except that he wills it. So by that it's clear that these things cannot be the same as his irada. And you say, well, why? Why should there be kufar and words of things? And the answer is, لا يسألوا أما يفعل وهم يسألون. He is not asked about what he does and they are asked about what they do. We cannot possibly ask or question the one who created us and knows everything about us and knows everything that is uh, more, knows everything about us more than we know about ourselves and knows everything about it, this existence. There are many things that we don't know. We are not in a position due to lack of knowledge to ever ask the one who knows everything. The the um the, the person who 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 knows nothing cannot possibly sort of question the judgment of the person who knows everything. <laughs> so the next one of the Sifat al Ma'ani, we have two so far, Qudra and Irada. The next one is ilm, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's knowledge. Um wala yuqalu muktasab. So the next one of these attributes is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's knowledge. Um, the fact that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows everything about absolutely everything. He knows everything about what is and everything about what could be. He knows everything about himself. He knows the most hidden things and the most manifest things. He knows the big picture, the small picture of everything. Every atom, he's Latif, he's Khabir. All of these are all things that describe Allah's Ta'ala's knowledge. So the way we get knowledge is that we study something or we look at something and then we learn about it. 
And that's how we arrive at knowledge. That's called iktisab. You cannot say that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's knowledge is learned by his interactions with existence. Even if it's certain ayats might sort of sometimes indicate that, that is not what they mean. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, his knowledge has been with him about everything, relating to everything, even before there was anything. Is that clear? So you can't say that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's knowledge stemmed from him studying something happening, an event, and then because of the various ways that things happening, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knew what would then happen. Um, some people have almost thought that because of certain ayats in the Quran that might indicate that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala only knows um, about something up after it has happened because he says, For example, in Surah Al-Kaf, he says that he will he, he gets them to do something so that he will then know, so that we will then know which of the things is more counted or whatever it might be. So that might lead you to believe that Allah didn't know it until he saw what they were going to do and then he knew. But that's not the way it works. <laughs> Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's knowledge does not work like that. It is not based on lack of knowledge then acquiring that knowledge because again that's something relating to existent emergent beings that we start from something that we don't know and then we arrive at something that we do know it starts and it stops which is hadith also Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows us better than we know ourselves so we often don't know what is good for us so what this means is that if we really wanted the best for ourselves, if we were really wise, we would follow everything that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us to do. Everything. We would follow it as closely as we could. Because he's, his knowledge of everything relating to us is much better than our own knowledge. If you are going to um, take an exam and somebody who aces every exam is going to give you some advice about how you do it, but you, you yourself who fail everyone and said, no, no, I know I'll, I'm gonna, I'll do it myself. Is that sensible? I mean, you, the, uh, I mean, obviously there's no comparison here. It's just a way of painting a picture, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows every intricate thing about what is good for us and what, what we don't know about ourselves. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in the Quran, for example, Asa an takrahu shay'an wa huwa khayru lakum wa asa an tuhibbu shay'an wa huwa sharrun lakum. So perhaps you will hate something and it's better for you, and perhaps you will love something and it is worse for you. We think from our own perspective that this is the thing to be doing, but it's not because we don't have knowledge. We are ignorant about many, many of the things that even relate to our innermost being. So accepting that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has full knowledge should mean that we endeavor to follow everything that he has asked of us because he we know that he knows everything about what is good for us then he says but tabi sabil al haq so follow the way of truth of what is real in other words follow the way of the people who've understood the truth except that these are these attributes must be for Allah and except what we've said with regard to their importance and what they relate to Qudra and Irad and all these things because there were people who saw, who disagreed with the fact that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for example had Qudra and Irada some would say oh Allah is Qadir Allah has power but you can't say that he has an attribute of Qudra but that's just semantics because if you are Qadir you have Qudra that's just <laughs> that's just the reality the reality of words so anyway, these attributes that we've been describing, understand that Allah is saying, understand that these are the attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and He necessarily has them, and then you'll understand the world better. So follow this path, and that's how you'll arrive at ma'rifatullah, of the knowledge of Allah. And leave, he says here, um, leave the doubts, leave the people of doubt. Do not follow the, and the people of doubt, he's referring to people like the Mu'tazila and these other groups who kept on arguing against certain attributes and certain ways of, for example, irada. They would say, no, no, we have our own absolute free will to choose 
various things. So they disagreed about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala having they 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 limited that attribute from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He said, Don't follow the people of doubt, follow the people of truth. Hayatuhu kadal kalam. So we just got a couple more attributes to talk about. The first of these is Hayat. Hayatuhu, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's life is one of his necessary attributes of meaning. And basically, life is one that they describe because we can tell if we look around the world, you have things like stones and animals and dead bodies and live bodies. Certain things such as power, will, and um, knowledge require life for, for, for them to, to exist. If you have a, a live body, that live body will then have the power to do things and will have the will to do things and will have knowledge. As soon as it's dead, zilch, doesn't have anything. Similarly, these other ones that we're going to come to, hearing and sight and speech, are requirements of li living things. For example, even animals, which we call living animals, they, they see and they hear and they make noises. Stones don't do any of that. Just inanimate. So life is, they're, they're, this is how they, they say that life has to be a condition for, for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because life is what is necessary for these other attributes to, to be existent. Kalam. So he says here, Hayatuhu kadal kalamu, speech, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks. This is not an easy one to understand because we associate kalam with words. Silence punctu or sounds punctuated by periods of silence different types of sounds following each other in certain orders. That's what we associate speech to be. That is not what we mean by the speech of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But it's necessary to believe that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has speech, otherwise there will, how would he communicate with us? How would we know what he has commanded and what he's prohibited? Basically, for him to interact with us, sending messengers, implies speech. So that implies that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has to have this quality of speech. So what is speech with respect to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? He's not like any created being, so it can't be this thing of having starts and stops in terms of sounds. But then how do we explain things like the Quran, which has sounds being the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And they say basically the way the way this like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, well, Allah Musa taklima. So we know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has speech from the Quran itself. Allah spoke to Musa with a with speaking. Allah Musa taklima. So basically, we say that things like the books of Allah and the Quran are when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala unveils or allows one of his created things to hear his speech. And he opens them up to that part of the speech that then becomes accessible to that created being. Rather than that being Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaking with, with sounds and stops and starts in that particular way. So in one sense, and this is something that is never said outside of lessons, the Quran is the word of Allah, but the words of the Quran are created. And they are sort of the expression that, 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 that the way that uh, a messenger can give expression within this creation to what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has unveiled to him of his speech and the parts of his speech that relate to commands and prohibitions and stories of previous peoples and so on and so forth. Allah's speech relates to everything, much like his ilm, much like his knowledge. So his communicating about those things is his speech to us. So it's a complicated one, in a sense. But we refer to the 
the Quran as the as the book of Allah because it contains all of the all of the direct communications that he trans that, 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 that he transmitted or was transmitted to his messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam but you cannot say that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's eternal speech has elements that start and stop and that are the same as the way that we speak as human beings Also, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's words are always true because they are part of the truth, which is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They are, they are his kalam. They are one of his essential attributes. They are necessary. And then the two others here are sam and basar, um, hearing and seeing. He says, kalamu sam'u thumm al-basar bithi atan sam'u. So the final ones here, Sam and Basar, hearing and seeing, are also attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because he tells us about them. He says here, be the atana sam'u, because the sam, what we hear, has brought these things to us. So he's talking here about kalam, sam and basar. So what is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's hearing and his seeing? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's hearing and his seeing is not like our hearing and seeing. Laysa kamithlihi shay wa huwa sami'ul basir. There is nothing like him, but he is the seeing, he is the hearing. So we say by this that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's seeing and hearing, he does not just see everything that is visible. He does not just see things. He see, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's seeing relates to sounds, it relates to possibilities. It relates to what is here and what is not here, and so on and so forth. There, everything that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's knowledge relates to, so too does his seeing. And everything that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's hearing relates to, you know, everything that his knowledge and his seeing relates to, his hearing also relates to that. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala hears essences as well as sounds. But what does hearing and seeing mean? They say oh, Allah knows best. But all we can say is that Allah's seeing and hearing are different from his knowledge and different from each other. They're different, different ways that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala interacts with everything that's necessary, possible, and impossible. Exactly what that means, who knows, but we cannot say that it's like our hearing or like our seeing. The sama, as I said, the, literally the hearing, what is heard, refers to all of the divine guidance that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has revealed to us, whether in the form of the actual books themselves, the divinely revealed texts, or in what the messengers have said or had said in front of them and affirmed or have done. All of that is part of the Sama. And so these, these things like Sami on Basir, that he's basically, his position here is, you cannot necessarily know them through the aql. It's not something that you can rationally say Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has to be hearing and seeing. Although some people have said that you can do it on the basis of kamal, of perfection. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala cannot have any imperfection if, uh, because you know his he, the thing that he's created could not be more perfect in any aspect than he is. So anything that's, that, that gives a greater degree to a created thing and makes it above another created thing, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will have that infinitely more. But that's, what they, that's the intellectualization. But they say that the actual real way you know these things is from the Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala never told us that he was semi basir We would have no, then have no obligation to believe that they were necessary to him. And um, those are the end of the uh, these particular sifat. So, I mean, before, is there any questions from anyone? Because I think uh, we, we, it's quite late now, so we'll probably leave it there. Um, yeah. Are there so, any questions online? Yeah, assalamu alaikum. Hello. Can you guys hear me? No. Apologies for the uh, stop start of today's class. There were some issues with my microphone, but it was resolved. 
Um, so the, this will continue next week. We will go into this, uh, the Sifat al Ma'nawiyah, which are the, um, when you say Qudra, it means that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is Qadir. So when we, they, they, they have some differentiation between the fact of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala being Qadir, being powerful, and the fact that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has power. Although they're pretty similar, they, they tend to include them both as separate attributes, due more to the fact that often the um, ones like Qadir and Samir imply the presence of something that's seen or heard directly, so they often more, cre more connect directly with creation. But that's not, I mean, a lot, there's a lot, of, a lot of the people of these sciences thought that they were pretty much the same thing. But he mentions them next week, inshallah. Also, um, some of the attributes like the Ma'nawi are very similar to the Af'al, the actions of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We talked about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala being creating, um, but then you can also say that knowing is an, is, is an action and so on. So there's a certain amount of overlap. No questions? All right. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alamin. Ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alamin. Ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Maliki yawm al-Din. Iyaka na'budu wa iyaka nasta'in. Ihdila sirat al-Mustaqim. Sirat al-Ladhina namta alayhim. Ghair al-Maghdubi alayhim. Waladhalin. Ameen. Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina Muhammadin abdika wa rasulika nabi ilmi wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam islima. Subhanahu rabbika rabbil azati ma'isfum wa sallam wa rasulim. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alamin. See you next time. Insha'Allah. As-salamu alaykum. Wa alaykum as-salam.